We're going to round out the show today, bringing in Rebecca Salmanen-Witt. She is the Chief Development and Communications Officer for the Detroit Historical Society. Great to have you with us on the Oakland County Megacast. Oh, so great to be here. Thanks for having us. For those that maybe aren't familiar with the Detroit Historical Society, fill us in about the society and what you offer to the community. So um, the Detroit Historical Society is almost 100 years old. Our 100th anniversary will be next year. We were founded in 1921. Um, The society operates the Detroit Historical Museum and also the Dawson Great Lakes Museum on Belle Isle. Um, And we also take care of nearly 300,000 of the city's artifacts from over 300 years of of history in the city. So um, we sort of, our mission is to um, tell Detroit stories and why they matter. We collect those stories from um, people, from objects, from um, kind of everywhere that we can find them. And then we tell the stories in engaging and interesting ways inside the museums. Right now, our, across the United States, there has been a big pushback on some of the monuments that have been standing in our communities. I read a post on social media the other day where someone basically said, Our history can't be erased. We need to acknowledge the history and grow and learn from it. And for the Detroit Historical Society, how important is education about where we came from and why it matters? Oh my goodness. So, you know, it's that's the core of what we do. We really think that a community can't become um, a, a community that learns and grows within itself until it shares its history. We can't move forward to be the kind of community that we really want to be unless we uh, take a, a page from the history books and, and really learn from what we have been through in the past. Um, you know, we presented a, an exhibition on um, Detroit 67, the civil unrest that happened in 1967 in Detroit. and. We used a different method of putting that um, exhibit together. We really went out and interviewed everybody we could find. Over 500 people gave oral histories for that exhibit. And it really allowed us to kind of dig down into that history and present it in a way that um, people weren't used to seeing from us. That exhibit ended up winning every major award for museums in the country. And last year it took second in the world. And the reason is because the community came together to talk to us about what was important about that story, what was important about that history. And we were able to put it together in a way that engaged the community now and created the opportunity to have contemporary conversations about this history that is absolutely so relevant to what our country is going through right now with the um, you know the struggle for social justice that's happening across the country right now that history of what happened here in Detroit in 1967 is one that can be instructive to people all across the country we get calls about it all the time it's just a really good example of how important um, that those moments in history are for what we're going through as a society today And every perspective is different and every perspective matters. I love that you went out and you captured their stories. I wonder from a historical society standpoint, what's it going to be like to document what we're going through right now? Oh, such a great question because what people don't think about that your historical society does for you is that contemporary collecting. So what we are going through right now is absolutely historic. Um, from the social justice issues that we talked about to of course the COVID-19 stuff that we're, we're all experiencing right now. So our historians are out collecting stories right now of what's happening during this time. In fact, um, your listeners and viewers can go to our website and create their own oral history, leave their story so that it'll be permanently archived for future Detroiters and people across the world to remember what this time is like. We're collecting artifacts for the time right now so that in 50 years or 100 years or 200 years, we have the stuff that tells the stories from this time so that people can learn from what we've gone through and hopefully have a better result for themselves. It is a fascinating time in our history. So many museums right now are struggling 
because uh, you know you rely on visitors and ticket sales and yep. are you currently shut down and doing things virtually what is that world looking like for you right now we were shut down until mid-july so in mid-july the governor allowed museums to reopen and um, so we are open and i you know please come and visit because we've got a lot of really cool stuff you know the permanent exhibitions that are there all the time but every year we open eight or ten new exhibits and we've got a new exhibit actually opening this weekend and we opened another one a couple of weeks ago so lots of reasons to come and visit our the detroit historical museum which is right in midtown on woodward 72,000 square feet i did the uh, numbers one day after we went through and kind of did our time ticketing and made sure that we could present a safe experience for our visitors and found that every visitor throughout the course of a day at the historical museum had 14,000 square feet to themselves. So it's really easy to socially distance in our museum. It's a big place. There's lots to see, um, three different floors of really engaging exhibitions. And those continue to be available. We're open Thursday through Sunday right now. Our museum on Belle Isle, um, the Dawson Great Lakes Museum is open Friday through Sunday right now as well. So plenty of reasons to come. Um, of course, while we were shut down, we like every museum across the country and really across the world pivoted to a lot of online and virtual um, programming. And we're continuing with that. That's not, you know, you don't roll that back once you once you go that direction. What we found is that we've got staff members who were really great. It was like a, you know, a stored up um, uh, desire that they had to make this virtual uh, program. I mean, and they were great at it. And so um, we premiered a lot of virtual um, programming during that time, and that will continue. In fact, our major fundraiser of the year, the, um, the Society Ball, which happens in January each year, is going to be a fully virtual experience this year. And so um, you can you know, participate in that experience in a whole bunch of different ways. Of course, it's a fundraiser. And so you know, we'll, have, we'll have our normal folks who, who want to support um, the work of the museum who do that in a similar way that they have even when it's not virtual, but it gives an opportunity for a lot more people all across the world to participate in our programming too. So in a way, the, the push toward virtual programming has been really good for us as an institution because it's given us the opportunity to make so much more of our collection of the stories that we tell, of the programming that we present, available to people all across the world. Whereas, you know, if you were in um, Paris or Hong Kong, you wouldn't necessarily make your way to Midtown Detroit to the Detroit Historical Museum. Now you can tune in and um, participate in that programming and see the really fabulous artifacts that we've got in our collection online. Rebecca Salmon and Witt, the Chief Development and Communications Officer at the Detroit Historical Society, is with us today on the Oakland County Megacast. And Rebecca, for those that do visit, you mentioned earlier that there's 14,000 square feet of space for every visitor, uh, typically in, in a typical day, to the Historical Society's Historical Museum. Uh, with all those artifacts that are there, are there still anything that's hands-on at this moment in, in time? And if that is the case, how are you keeping those hands-on materials safe for those that are coming in? Yeah, I'm glad you asked because we went through a whole, when we learned that we were going to be able to uh, reopen, which was kind of late June, um, we went through a whole protocol and worked with all of our other museum partners in um, Midtown to, um, well, we, we actually contracted with a firm called the National Sanitation Foundation, um, and they created protocols that we all follow in terms of consistently cleaning and sanitation and one-way tracks through the museum so that you're not bumping into other people all the time. And um, those, um, those have been very effective. Uh, we do have, still have some hands-on stuff, so um, the, the buttons that you can push and all those kind of things, the main thing that we did there was um, we got some styluses. Everybody who visits the museum gets a stylus so they can push the button with their stylus, not their finger. Um, and we've got a cleaning crew who is going through the museum on a you know, all day long um, while we're open and um, cleaning, wiping surfaces, um, sweeping, you know, cleaning, cleaning, cleaning 
all day long. It's funny because we used to have those folks and say, you know, you've got to stay in the background. We don't want the visitor's experience to be interrupted by you cleaning. Now we're like, get out there and make sure people see you cleaning. So it's a whole different way of doing it, but, um, but so important now. And um, we're really proud that our visitors have had um, no problem observing masking protocols. Um, they're using the styluses. Um, they're following the arrows on the floor. And so it really is a very safe experience for our visitors. With that, is there concern about all the cleaning agents in the building damaging some of those valuable artifacts? And, you know, because cleaning supplies can have certain products in them that could be damaging and you've gone to such great lengths to try to collect and preserve this history you don't want it to be ruined because you're trying to keep everyone safe from COVID-19. Yeah, no kidding. Well, you know, museums have their secrets and we've got the special cleaning agents that make it safe. Of course, our very valuable um, you know, items that are uh, that would degrade with even with human touch are under glass. And so um, those, you know, we, we clean the vitrines, we clean the glass, but um, we don't actually have to come in contact with those really delicate items. Um, other things we've got cleaning um, stuff that that is both disinfecting and um, safe for the artifacts. So we're we, you know, our, our museum staff has that pretty well figured out. Just a couple more minutes here with you before we let you go. I would imagine that this is such a great field trip for parents to be able to take their kids. They're remote learning. They want to be able to get out, explore the museums in our own backyard. If I'm a parent and I'm bringing my child for the first time, what are the must-see exhibits? Oh my gosh. Well, so you're going to want to for sure see the glancy trains because the kids like that, right? So that's the that's sort of the treat at the end. That's in our lower level where the streets of old Detroit are. Streets of old Detroit take you from eight, the 1840s all the way to the 1900s. Um, and, you know, that new exhibit that we're opening this weekend is on Detroit's brewing history. And it's in that area, too. And so a little something for the parents in that stage, too. Um, you're going to want to see um, America's Motor City, which is our... Um, exhibit that has all the cars in it. It's got a, a Model T that the kids can touch and um, and it's got a, um, a working body drop from a Cadillac factory from the 80s so they can actually see the car go up and down. And, um, and so that's a really cool one too. Um, right upstairs, um, right now in particular, um, so on our second floor, there's the Gallery of Innovation that kids love because there's got an interactive there where they can make soda pop and make a car and, and do those kind of things. We also just opened a new exhibit on that floor that is about um, Detroit's techno music festivals. So 20 years of techno in Detroit, and that's a super cool exhibit that particularly if you've got older kids, um, they're going to love because it's got the, you know, the beats are worked in there and um, the, the photography is really beautiful and engaging. Um, so that's an important one. And then finally on that same second floor, um, we've got our Underground Railroad exhibit, um, Doorway to Freedom, which leads right into Detroit 67, that, that award-winning um, exhibition. You know, um, that's heavy stuff for your littler kids, but really important and, and quite frankly in the world we're living in, I don't think it's ever too early to learn those lessons. So um, something on every floor for sure. Something for everyone to see and do and to experience all that is our history here in Detroit and the greater metro area. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us. We definitely appreciate it and we encourage everyone to get out to the museum and enjoy what's being offered. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about Detroit's history and welcome people down to the museums. Thank you so much. It's open Thursday through Sunday.